song of God coming running to you. We're often told, and we've been taught in years gone by, that we've got to search earnestly. And God's hiding somewhere and playing hide and seek with mankind. And he's in a mystical place that we can never get to. The thing is that when Jesus came, God in man on earth, he broke all that down. God is not hiding. In fact, he's running towards us. He's searching for man. He's searching for you and for me. We've heard from the Gospel of uh, sorry, 1 John that we are now children of God. So those watching online, we welcome you. And you guys down here on Zoom, we welcome you and everybody here. But we are the children of God. And this is something, I read this in, this is the message version of the Bible. It's Romans 8. And it says, God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. Now that might surprise some people, but God did know what he was doing. He knew when he was going to create man, that it was going to cost his son his life. The moment he thought that idea, he could see what was going to happen. He knew what it was going to cost him, and yet he still made man. And he made you. So this is awesome. So he knew what he was doing from the beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines of the life of his son. The Son stands as first in line of humanity he has restored. We see the original and intended shape of our lives there in Jesus. After God made that decision of what, of what his children should be like, he followed it up by calling people by name. He called us by name. Christine, Dawn, you know, John, he called us all by name. It's not some mystical thing. He calls you all by name. After he has called them by name, he set them on a solid basis, which is himself. And then after getting them established, he stayed with them to the end, glor gloriously completed all that he had begun. Now, I know the message isn't brilliantly accurate, but it actually is really good to sometimes just unpack stuff. So this morning, I want to continue where I... Uh, in a sense, left off last week and looking at our identity. I've talked to my past about who we are in Christ and things like that, but I really want to nail down some things on our identity because there's many people who are very confused over their identity. I'm not <coughs> going to get into that again this week. But people don't understand that God actually knows us. It's not a mistake. It's not set things in motion and now God's getting a little bit old and he's sat on the throne slightly senile, not knowing what his kids are up to. God knows everything. He's not old in the sense of getting old like we do. He's still active, he's still on board and he's still very sharp. He's a classic old person that's not so fast, but he's sharp. He is fast as well, but that's nothing. But... As Christians, as believers in God, we need to understand that not only does God love us, but he knows us. Now that should either put you on a good setting, or should get you very aware of things. Because if he knows you, then if you're up to no good, he knows. If you're up to good, he knows. So you should also go, God, he knows. He knows what I do in that secret place when I'm praying for people, but he also knows what you do in that secret place when you're up to no good. But the fact that he knows you, and he knows what you like, and still loves you, and still likes you. I think that's quite amazing. Because for some people, you know as Christians we're supposed to love everybody. Now some people are easy to love. I mean nobody has a problem loving either, do they? I mean she's gorgeous. <laughs> Trotting around, looking sternly at people, working out what's going on, checking you out. Yeah. Be kind of a lover. Some other people are a bit more awkward. And I don't mean loving people in the 60s style of loving, but in the genuine caring for people. But so, identity for us, we are known by God. That we, are, we have been known since the beginning. You see, before the, everything was created, God had you in mind. He had a thought for you, he had a purpose for you, he had a design for you. But he also knew you'd mess up. Bristol had planned for you. It says this in Isaiah 44, verse 24. This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, who formed you in the womb, I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by himself. 
You know, we often talk about the science of things, but according to the Bible, it's God that starts knitting you together in the womb. That's why life in the womb is important. And I know people everywhere have different opinions, but what a crazy world we're living in when we need to have debates about whether killing a baby at 20 weeks, 25 weeks, 30 weeks, whether it's moral or not. What world are we living in when killing something is a debate on morality? When really it shouldn't be a debate on that, it's a life. End of story. But God knitted it together, knitted us together. I mean, I'm glad that my parents didn't take the decision that they were being encouraged to do with me when I was in my mother's womb, otherwise I wouldn't have been here. My mum was 16 when she was pregnant with me, and it wasn't a joyful occasion for most people. She was put under pressure, but she stuck to her guns. She's a redhead. Have you ever wondered where my kids get the red hair from? It's from my mother. You know what I mean? And their temperament goes with it. Jeremiah 1 verse 5 says this, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So before you were a twinkle in your daddy's eye, or your granddad's eye, or somebody in your distant past eye, God knew you. It's like he looked down the line of generations and went, Kelly, I know you. Before you were even born, before it was even something in your mum's eyes, it was... He knew, he said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you to be prophet of the nation. Now, we may not all be called to be prophets of the nations, but before you were born, I set you apart. We're all set in Christ, apart from the world, in Christ, with a purpose and with something to do. If you really want to get into the whole thing before you were born and what God knows about it, Psalm 139 is a great psalm. And a couple of verses from that, I, I would encourage you to read that up for yourself later on. But it says, my frame is not hidden from you. This is the psalmist writing this. My body is not hidden from, from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Now we need to be understand this talk about depths of the earth. It's been in the, in the inside, but it's also indicating in that secret place that you were actually a thought and a, and a desire in God's eyes before it was in your parents' eyes or before you were a mistake or a nick up or whatever you want to put on there planned or unplanned that you were woven together in the depths of the earth your eyes saw my unformed body all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to pass and just need to point out with this that God writes down all your days in the book before that one of them comes to pass does not mean that God says you can have 20 days, you can have 20 years, you can have 120 years. It's up to us how long we live. You, know, you do appreciate that. People say, well, God knows when you're going to die. Of course he knows when you're going to die. But that's not always the best plan for you. Because in the Bible it says that if you honour your father and mother, it will go well with you and you will live long. Which would indicate that if you don't honour your father and mother, they will kill you. <laughs> Oh God, in circumstances. In other words, if you don't listen to what they're saying and don't honour what they're saying to you and don't honour them, then it will not go well with you. Basically, if you are a silly person who does rock climbing without ropes, I rock climb, but I use ropes now. But if I fell off a rock and landed and died and went before God and said, God, my time was up, God said, no, it wasn't, you were an idiot. You should have used the ropes. You shouldn't be so stupid. So, you know, if you're not looking where you're going and you get knocked down, you know, I wonder how many angels have got bruises because we've not looked where we're going and they got the impact instead of us. But before all our days were ordained for us, before the, sorry, for me, were written in the book, even before one of them came to pass. We need to remember that we're made up of, of three parts. If you, I ain't got this written down, but I think it'd be important for us that in Genesis 1, In Genesis 1, um, this is a sixth day, and God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, livestock creatures that move along the ground, wild animals according to their kind. And it was so, God made the wild animals. Out, so God made animals out of the muck, out of the cave, out of the earth. Verse 26 says this, Then God says, Let us make... So God made the animals, it says, 
according to, to their kind, he brought them out of the uh, moved along the ground, he brought them out of the ground, and he made them. Then he says, let us make God, uh, make man, sorry, in our image, in our likeness. The word make fair, remember? Next verse on, it says, so God created man. That's a completely different Hebrew word. So what's going on? And then later on, um, in chapter 2, verse 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth and from the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And the word formed there is different to create, which is different to make. You think he's using different Hebrew words? Because God thought of you before he even made creation. He actually made an idea of you, and you, because he thought of you, he'd already got the idea of you. You, in a sense, were there in some form. So then God says, I'm going to create you in my image. What's the image of God? God is spirit. So God made us, and we're spirit, we're spirit beings. Your real you, your true identity is your spirit inside you. And then you've got your, your soul or your heart and all that stuff mixed in. But there's a problem. You needed a body. So he made or formed the body out of the dirt and then he stuck you in that body. So you, this, that we spend so much money on. It's interesting, you know, Jill complained, um, we're not complained, but we, we had a chat about our water meter. Because I get a bath. But when I fill the bath, it's like a swim pool and all four of us and the dog can get in. It's just there. I mean, we didn't buy the thing. We're in, we moved in. So she says, you know, it's costing a fortune for all these baths you keep adding. But then I would lay in the bath thinking about this with my bubbles. <laughs> and going, you know what? I only have a, a, you know, a bit of shaving foam and a, a shaver, water bath and a bit of bubble bath. You know, it is a bit of washing stuff. But if I go into that secret place in my bedroom and open the doors, there's lotions and potions for all sorts. I mean, there's stuff to put on and stuff to take off and stuff to put some else. I mean, how much money must some people spend on their appearance and the outside's just going to rot away? I mean, I don't spend anything on shampoo. I am blessed. And I'd have to do my hair all the time. I'd have to buy combs and brushes. I'm saving a fortune. And it means God... He can spot me a mile away and count the hairs on my head pretty fast. Zero. Sorted. It's not like he's going to spend time working through all your knit infested hairs. I mean, mine's zero. You know what I mean? God knew us. So he took us. The idea of you and me. He took us. And then he made a body. And he shoved us in that body. And that's why when we died, our bodies go into the ground and just rot away. And that we are absent from the body, present with the Lord. So the people that's died before us, they're now parting their back to, in a sense, the way that God saw them. And then God's going to give them a brand new body. Why do they need a brand new body? Because they're going to live down on earth, but they're also going to go to heaven. They're going to be in between the two. We're going to be like Jesus was, and Jesus walked through walls. He appeared and disappeared. I mean, that's got to be a right thing, hasn't it? That's our new bodies. We will be like him. When we see him, we'll be like him. Anyway, sorry, I've just jumped into something completely different. And we just go back. So back into the fact that Jesus, that God knew you right from the beginning. But not only did he know you, he loved you. And that you're precious to him. And that you're valued. You see, many of us might claim that we weren't planned. Guys, I was not planned by my parents. I didn't sit down and go, you know what? Let's have a baby. But some are. Some people plan to have a baby and then they, they keep trying and keep trying and keep trying and eventually it gets there. And then they have these great ideas that are going to have a boy it turns out to be a girl. I mean, nowadays it's a bit different because they can check out what's going on. But they plan it. Some people don't plan it. It's a surprise to them. Some are unwanted. So many are unplanned. It's just shock to everybody. But all of us... Whether you were loved and, and planned for, whether you were unplanned, a surprise, or whether you were unwanted, you were still loved by God. I got a friend who were adopted and, and uh, they said they had a great life. And other people, you say to them, yeah, but you were adopted. 
Does it make you feel? I'm like, are you kidding? I mean, you have no choice over your parents, but my, church, my parents walked into a room, went, that one please, and chose me out of all them kids. I mean, my mum had no choice. I came out. It was me. Hello, I'm here. She had no choice in it. I mean, the only you know, thing that I do look like my dad, and I look, look, look a little bit like my mum, so you can tell we're there. But when somebody's adopted, somebody chooses them. The Bible talks about how we are adopted into the family of God. And in Ephesians, it talks about how God chose us. Now, I don't want to get into predestination in the extreme Calvinistic way, but let's just take it. The Bible says you were chosen. It says it. So we'll study that another time. But you were known by God. You were loved by God. You're precious to God and you're valued to God. Psalm 139 says this. This is verse 2 and 4. It says, you know that when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. God knows when you're... You're in bed and when you're out of bed, he knows when you get up and when you sit down. He knows when you're lazy and you should get up. And he knows when you're up and active. He knows it all. He's there. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. In other words, God's watching over you. He's, he's there. He's not like a shepherd who's just about. He's right there with you. Not only is he within us, he's watching over. He says, before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it and complete it. He knows what you're going to say. Now, that's not an excuse not to say things. That's actually things you should say. You should know that God's listening, that he's there and is aware of what you're talking about. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 12, 13, it says this. And I know, now I know in part, I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. God knows you fully. Even the unbelievers, he knows them. Everybody will stand before God one day. Because God knew us before creation, he had a plan and he, he, he had an idea. Every one of us, every human being born, whether, you know, in, whether they die in the womb or whether they die of old age or somewhere in between, every one of us will stand before God. Every person ever exists on this planet lives forever. We all live forever. But some will live with God and some will live away from God into outer darkness, often known as hell. So when God created man, he wasn't just forming us out of the dirt. He actually breathed eternal life into us. Your spirit lives forever. That's your identity. That's why your spirit and who you are on the inside is more important than who you are on the outside. Now I need to put a disclaimer in here. What you are on the outside does affect other people, so please wash and put right guard on. Oh, brute, it smells good. <laughs> Anybody <laughs> watch Sorry. Hey, I like brute. <laughs> it's been around a long time, but it's there. Denim went years ago, didn't it? We used to go ah, slap the hand and keep off. And there's others. But for you and for I, our outside effects of the people. Our expressions, what we do and things like that can affect the people. But remember your true identity, your true self is not the outside, it's actually the inside, the real you. And often we hide the real us sometimes or sometimes we're be quite open about it. But the real you is the one that exists on the inside. Isaiah 43 verse 4 says this, Since you are precious and honoured in my sight, and because, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you nations for your life. Let's just look that up because that kind of throws a verse on its own can be a bit complicated. So Isaiah 43. Hey, I even have got a lot of stuff. So at least look like you're getting your Bibles out and look like you're checking. So at least look on your know, solitaire on your phone. If I'm going to find it, you should. Isaiah 43. So Isaiah 43, I'll go from verse 1. It says this, But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, who formed you, um, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. This sounds very familiar, doesn't it? From what we've already read. And you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Anybody in troubles? Yeah. 
It says he's going to be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. I'm surprised Sweet has not got this underlined in your Bible. This is good stuff. <laughs> and when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. My mate used to love this verse. He said, do you know what that is? He, he, he smoked. He, you know, he was a smoker. A uh, real on fire Christian. He says, you know, one day God's going to take these things away. And he did. But when he read this, he said, when I walk through the fire, I won't be burned. I can even lean over and spark this back up. I thought... <laughs> Not kind of a good thing, but I see his intentions. Uh, you won't be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I gave Egypt as a ransom. Cush um, in, uh, in your stead. And that's when it goes off. Since you are so precious to me and honoured in my sight, because I love you, I will give men in exchange for you and people in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid. I am the Lord who is with you. I mean, if you've got anything this morning, that one, Isaiah 43. So, it's just fascinating that God actually loves us. He actually sees us precious in his sight and he values us. Romans 5 verse 6 to 8 says this. See that just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. He can write himself in there because we were all the ungodly. Very rarely will anybody die for a righteous person, though for a good person, somebody might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, or in some versions it said enemies of God, Christ died for us. Well, we couldn't give two oops about God. Well, mankind didn't even consider even investigating who God for. He came, he left heaven, he came to earth to a stable, he spent 30 odd years listening to the gossip and people having a go at him. See, we don't appreciate that we look at Jesus' life as the last week and the torment on the cross, but in Psalms it indicates that Jesus lived a life of, of people having a go at him because of his upbringing, because of the whispers and the backgrounds about his mum and dad. Even his own brothers had a go at him as he was growing up. And he carried all that weight, knowing that the people he was willing to die for were the ones who were insulting him. And they got worse and worse as it got towards the end. But while we didn't care, Jesus came and he died for us. I mean, I'm not being funny. Most of us might put ourselves in danger for somebody we love. Most parents would be willing to lay down their lives to save their own children. Um... But you probably wouldn't do it for somebody who hated you. You wouldn't be too quick to say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take your punishment of somebody that hates you. And yet Jesus, when we hated him, when we were sinners and when we were enemies of God, he still came because of the love of God. I had an old girlfriend many years ago and she just couldn't get past the idea of God's love. She needed to feel God's love. She wanted to, she said, oh, I want to do is feel his love. I said, love's not just, it's not an emotional warmth or something like that, even though it can be that. Love is demonstrated. Love is shown. Love is giving up something. Love, love is being there for people. But she wanted the gooey feeling and, and that can be there. But it wasn't, and when I used to read this verse to her and other people used to say, God demonstrate, she said, but I don't feel it. Eventually I'd say, look, are you saved? Are you saved? Because according to James, you know, we should be not just hearers of the word, but doers, and, and we need to trust what we read and, and listen to what we're reading and put it into action and do what we're told from the word of God and just accept the fact that God loves you. But she couldn't. She found it so hard. Yet God loves us all. Isaiah 53 verse 10 says this, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. He's talking about Jesus. So the Lord there is God. It was the Father's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. See, the, the cross was not an accident. The cross was there because you have an identity, an attachment to God the Father. And God wanted to renew because of sin it had parted and broken down. And he wanted to bridge that gap. 
So God sent his one and only son and according to Isaiah 53 verse 10 it said, yeah, it, it was God's will. In other versions it said, it, it pleased the Lord to crush him and have him suffer. <laughs> I won't put my lad deliberately in place to suffer for people that hated me. Are you getting what's going on here? When we were enemies of God, he sent his one and only son who he loved so much himself in man who then died and he said it pleased the Lord to do that. Why? Because of his love for you. Don't ever say to me you don't think God loves you because I'm likely to slap you so it moves arm in. Because either God loved you or he didn't. We need to get over ourselves. It's called pride. That's what it is. Self-centeredness. Oh, well, God loves me. Yet he demonstrated it. What more do you want? Well, what? No, it's, we need to get off the pride banner and start just trusting God. It pleased the Lord to crush him. And the word there means to grind down. To grind it down. And to cause him to suffer. <laughs> You've got to put yourself in God the Father's position with one of your own children. Think about that. To suffer. And through and though the Lord makes his life an offering, a sin offering, it says this, he will, he will see his offsprings and product. That's us. His offspring is us. His offspring are those that came from God. Why do you think in the Old Testament God used to say to Abraham all the time, your offspring will be like the sand of the shore and the stars in the sky. Because the sand of the shore were his physical offspring. The world, the earthly ones. But the heavenly ones, the spirit, that's us. That's us. <laughs> and he said no man will be able to count them. He can't count the stars. So nobody will have to count. Yet God knows exactly how many they are. The Lord will prosper and the Lord's will will prosper in his hand. And that's through us. Let's have a look at Zephaniah. Most people don't even know that book exists. Zephaniah 3 verse 17. I won't ask you to turn to it because we don't want to stay until next week. But it says this, The Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will save. He rejoices over you with gladness. He will quietly... He, in, he will quietly you, quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. You want to feel God's love, just his peace. The peace that you have is God's love for you. It's an amazing verse, is that? If you read it in the, um, where's that? If you read it in the New American Standard Version, this makes me smile. That's why it's good to check out verses. In the New American Standard Version, it says this, the Lord your God is in the midst of you, a victorious warrior. You can always see a difference between the new King James and the, it's on the American side, which are loud, big, boisterous, they're out there. He says, the Lord your God, I'll do it in American, not in an accent, but American style. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He rejoices over you with joy and he will quiet you with love and rejoice over you with shouts of joy. That's powerful, isn't it? Yeah. And we need that. But you know, some other people need this. The New King James Version. The Lord is in your midst. The mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. And with quietness. In quietness, he will love you. And he will rejoice over you with singing. Like a parent with a baby. When they're putting them to sleep in quietness, they're going, not going... Wait, shout over you! It's quiet. Now, some need the quietness and the love. Some need the warrior. And the both fair. I thought it was quite funny between the American and the English. Not that we're quiet all the time. But some of you need the quietness of a parent. God the Father just embracing you. Taking you in his arms. I mean, the fact that he sings over us, it's bizarre. You know, shouldn't we be singing to God? But he's a parent. I mean, how many of us have had little babies in our arms? And even if they're not ours, we start humming to them, rocking them, caring for them. You've got this all to come, guys. 
It's not just sleepless nights, there's great things. <laughs> you rock them to sleep, it's amazing. And then you go in. I mean, I remember going in in the middle of the night to poke them to see if it's still all right. We've all done it. Because our heart goes out to them. And the fall scrape the knee. And you're there. How many adults, um, even with grown up kids, find out there's an illness with their child, no matter all that? but they wish it upon themselves instead of their own children because of the love there. And that's the impression I have of Father God, that he, so he sees our true identity, the potential that we have, the greatness that is within us, and he's trying to draw us close to him. And the only way he could do it is by sacrificing his own son so we could have access to God. And that's what Jesus died on the cross for. And I'm going to stop there because I really feel God's... God's saying something. I'll finish off the next stuff um, next time. But this morning, not only did Jesus die on the cross so we could have heaven, but he died on the cross so we could have life on earth. He came that we may have life and have life to the full. And life to the full is not being sick. It's not wandering around in sickness and illness. But it's the world we live in. And I really think, for you guys at home, and also for you guys here, I'm going to, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand if you're sick. You're ill, you've got something wrong with you. But I'm also going to ask you to stand if there's somebody else that you know that needs God's touch right now. And I'm going to pray over you guys, and we're going to, you're going to bounce it either for yourself or onto the other person. We had handkerchiefs, we're in the new technology of a spoken word. The guy came to Jesus and he just said, speak the word. And I'm going to speak the word. I'll remind you what the Bible says. Psalm 103, it's a great verse. It says, praise the Lord, O my soul, in my innermost beings, in your true self. Praise the Lord, name. Praise the Lord O my self, and forget not his benefits, who forgives all our sins and heal all our diseases. If you believe God forgives all your sins, and I hope you do, then he must heal all your diseases. But if he doesn't heal all your diseases, according to this verse, then he can't, heal, he can't forgive all his sins. It's one or the other. He either does it for all or not at all. And I believe he did it for all on the cross. He forgave all our sins and heals all our diseases. And he will redeem our lives from a pit. And he does crown us with love and with compassion. James 5 says this. And I'm just running through it so you can decide whether you want to stand and, and be prayed for this morning. At home, it's going to be a bit awkward. You're just going to have to stand there and people wonder what you're doing. But if you know someone who's sick, your home can stand and be prayed for as well. James 5 says this. If anyone is in trouble, anybody in trouble? He should pray. Is anybody happy? <laughs> Sing songs of joy of praise. If anyone is sick, the word sick there means if you're sick in body, sick in mind, sick in heart, or just sick of being sick. That's it. Sick. It means it encompasses all sickness. So don't go, oh, he's not talking about my sickness. No. If you're sick, he should call upon the elders of the church. Now, I'm an elder in the church as pastor. It's, that's what I am as well. But you stand, that's your call. You guys online, that's your call. And he says it's a prayer offered in faith. And guys, I've got the faith. We'll make the sick man well. And the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. I'll tell you something. According to 2 Corinthians 5.17, you know, I am the righteous of God in Christ. So we've ticked all the boxes according to the word of God. So we're just going to pray. So if you're sick in, in yourself, then you stand. If... You're st you can stand for somebody else that you know is sick.